The demon prince goes to the academy after having left the palace. Harriet quickened her pace. The man she had thought to be a good adviser until now had shown her a completely different side. And the intense sense of unease she felt soon turned into a chilling fear. Though nothing had actually happened to her, Harriet was able to intuitively sense through their few conversations that was not a normal magician. He seemed to be following her, for some reason. She felt certain of it. He constantly muttered strange things and spoke to her in ways she couldn't discern the intentions behind. If only she had known him sooner, she might have appreciated his almost divine level of praise. But even then, she couldn't understand the nonsense he spouted about being a god of a new world. But a normal magician would never say such things. Harriet had walked the path of an elite magician. Magicianship was fundamentally the study of geniuses. But there were also street magicians and those who learned magic from them certainly existed. They were usually madmen and eccentrics. Harriet had heard that there were countless lunatics who enjoyed tormenting those without talent for magic by teaching them magic forcibly. Soon enough, as an elite magician, Harriet had little experience dealing with such mad magicians. Her father was a grand magician, and those who taught her magic were generally sane magicians with clean thoughts. The only madman she had dealt with was Aaron Mead, who had created a chimera in the basement of her mansion some time, some time ago. So, it was only natural for her to be engulfed in fear when Roswin, who seemed perfectly fine, started spouting strange nonsense. The legendary villains she heard about from her older brother or father as a child were certainly not like this, however. Harriet could feel in real time just how terrifying it was to face someone with immeasurable madness. She repeatedly looked back as she walked. Was he following her? She had the feeling that he was somehow obsessed with her. What on earth would he do to her if he was indeed following her? Her steps quickened, and even among the passengers on the magical train heading back to the temple, Harriet was sweating cold sweat, eating cold sweat. Nothing had happened, but it felt as if something was about to though she knew her anxiety was probably unfounded. Harriet couldn't help feeling restless, the strange gazes he cast upon her, the burning desire in his eyes when he talked about magic books, the completely incomprehensible and nonsensical ramblings, hoping that such a mad magician would not try to harm her in any way. Harriet practically ran back to the temple once she got off the train. A slight sense of relief washed over her as she crossed the temple gate. But it wasn't enough. The tram was empty because it was nighttime. Only a few students were on the tram, busy with their own affairs, while Harriet looked around nervously, sweat dripping, dripping, dripping from her brow. The thought of being caught up in a situation where she might become the target of a mad magician, something she had never heard of, made her blood run cold. It must be a mere delusion, she thought, lately. Her nerves had been on edge, causing her to overreact to trivial matters. But even so, the bizarre stories she had heard from Roslyn made it difficult for her to dismiss the possibility altogether. With a heavy heart filled with dread, Harriet finally arrived at the Royal Class Dormitory's bus stop and entered the building. And then, as soon as she returned to the second year dormitory, Harriet instantly felt the fear and anxiety that had been knowing, knowing at her dissipate. Go. Greenhut, with a towel draped around his neck as if he had just taken a shower met her gaze as he walked towards the lobby. Lately, it had always been like this. Greenheart hesitated for a moment but never initiated a conversation with her, however. He was there, and she believed that Greenheart would somehow manage to help her. She didn't want to admit it, but she couldn't deny it either. The anxiety that had been gripping her heart vanished like a lie the moment she saw Greenheart's face. But her tension reflexively released upon seeing Greenheart and Harriet's legs suddenly went weak. Stagger. Hey, what's wrong with you? Just before Harriet collapsed, Reinhardt quickly caught her, leaning on him. She bit her lip. There were certainly people stronger than Reinhardt, and many more reliable than him. But why did his face bring her such a profound sense of relief? Why are you covered in cold sweat? Reinhardt hesitated but couldn't help checking on Harriet's complexion cautiously. The reason Harriet felt reassured when she saw Reinhardt, she thought she knew it. But she, it was because he was a bad person. He was a madman who would impulsively propose a marriage to protect someone precious to him. Like he did when he learned of Charlotte's life being in danger. 
he was a bad person because he would do such things, knowing full well that it would hurt those around him, and so, if something happened to her like it did to Charlotte, he would somehow, by any means necessary, come through for her. He might be a bad person and shameless, but he had always come through in the past, and she believed he would again. That's why Harriet couldn't help but feel relieved when she saw Reinhardt. Harriet wanted to hate Reinhardt, instead. Hey, hey, why are you like this? Did something happen? She wanted to hate him and, in fact, did hate him, but as much as she hated him, she trusted Reinhardt. I don't know. I don't even know why I'm like this. And because she liked Reinhardt more than she hated him, just, just, stay like this for a moment, just stay like this for a moment. Do what? Oh. Who? Oh, okay, I got it. In the end, Harriet could not hate Reinhardt any more than she already did. Do you think it's a misconception? I, uh, now that I think about it, I was just scared for no reason. Nothing actually happened. What's this? Ah, uh, I thought Harriet was caught up in something serious, but she said it wasn't a big deal after all. No, it's just. People keep praising me as a genius and there's this person. It's a bit suspicious, I guess. I wonder if they have some hidden agenda. They said some strange things, but it seems like they were just weird. I don't know how to put it. I was just scared for no reason. Delusions. At my words, Harriet's face turned bright red. Delusions, I think. What could it be? Uh, according to Lucina's way of speaking, did our little cutie have some sort of exit of grin attribute? Probably not. It just felt like that person was following me, coming after me. I was scared. But now that I think about it, they were just strange. They never did anything bad to me or asked anything of me deliberately. There are many eccentric magicians, so... When I think about it, that person isn't that odd. I think I just misunderstood. Her embarrassment made her pronunciation jumble and her speech adorable. And it's nice to be able to see this cute sight without much guilt. In the end, she got so scared because the research assistant, who had been helping her, excessively praised her, that she ran away to the temple. I still don't know what strange things were said, but magicians are known for their bizarre statements. And it's not just a one time thing. Anyway, I was stuck, wondering if I should distance myself from Harriet. But Harriet took the initiative. It's fortunate that it wasn't a serious matter after all. I was worried something terrible had happened, and my heart sank. It's a relief if it was just a misunderstanding. Because of the misunderstanding, we can now talk like this. Quite normally, Harriet and I were sitting face to face in the dining hall, and I met Harriet right after finishing my duel with Ellen and taking a shower. Ah, Ellen so. It was natural for Ellen, who had just finished her shower, to come to the dining hall for a meal. Ellen looked at Harriet and me, who were sitting face to face, and then sat down next to Harriet, as if it were obvious. Is there something you want to eat? Our stoic friend asked, her eyes practically shining. I'll make something for you today. It seemed like she was quite fond of this situation. Harriet looked at Ellen with a complicated expression not knowing what to say. It seemed like she was about to smile, but also like she might cry, with a complex expression. Do, do I, feel hungry? What's with you? And then, a rather unfamiliar voice for the class dormitory, even at this ambitious hour, came from behind us. Is it really appropriate for a mere knight to be ordering around their lord like this? With her arms folded, Charlotte stared at Ellen with an annoyed expression, no way. Did Ellen actually summon Charlotte herself? I can cook well. I'll make something for you. My knight doesn't particularly need to be skilled with a knife, you know. You know. Well, there's no need to be bad at it either. I'm better than you, who can't do either. Is that so? How can you be sure I can't cook when you've never seen me do it? Obviously, you can't because you grew up in an environment where you couldn't possibly learn to cook well. Fine. I can't. I can't cook. But did you call me just to pick a fight? In the middle of the night. I called you to make food. But you're the one who started the fight. I was just trying to be considerate. You're the one who makes a fuss over nothing. 
who taught you to be so annoying when you're right? Ellen silently pointed at me with a gesture. How can she be so good at getting under people's skin when she doesn't seem like it? It's driving me crazy. Whoa. Now you're making me angry without even saying a word. Getting angry easily. That's a sickness. I've been seeing this kind of situation more often lately. Charlotte and Ellen have a bad chemistry. Unlike Ellen and Olivia. And Ellen seems to talk more when she's with Charlotte. When she argues with Olivia, she just says things like, go away or, I don't like it, anyway, what do you want to eat? At Ellen's question, Charlotte grinned. Beef or women, what should I do? Our first princess started acting spoiled. But what followed was even worse. Worse. Use only tenderloin for the meat. I usually like fatty cuts, but I'm on a diet these days, and no spices, especially pepper. I hate chefs who use spices to cover up their poor skills. As for wine, use a red wine from Rizal. Just eat what you're given without being picky. Ellen said exactly what I was thinking, of course. Charlotte's face turned red upon hearing that. What? Picky. Did you just call me picky? By picky, I meant fussy about your looks. You're pretty, so you're fussy enough to demand a pretty dish, too. What? What did you say? If you don't understand, just eat what you're given, hey? Where are you going? I'm not running away. I'm going to the kitchen. Ellen, tired of Charlotte's nagging, entered the kitchen, and Charlotte started watching her from behind, apparently wanting to keep an eye on her. Harriet and I stood there with our mouths agape, watching Ellen and Charlotte's argument. Hey? You know what? I think I know what you're trying to say. Last year, it felt like you and I were like that and I were like- Though the context was different, the flustered Charlotte and the still fighting Ellen were the spitting image of Harriet and me last year. That wasn't the only similarity. I don't like carrots. Eat it. Ugh. Seriously. You won't let me off. I have a knife, you know. Who you really don't hold back, do you? Reinhardt, I'm feeling dizzy listening to the bickering of Ellen and Charlotte. Harriet slumped onto the table, groaning in discomfort. Truth be told, I'm still not used to this either. In a way unrelated to their social statuses, the conversation between the two was quite nauseating. Seeding. Ellen had prepared beef bourbon and presented it before us, while Charlotte snickered with her arms crossed. Sorry, but do you remember me saying I'm on a diet? What do you think I'd eat after 11 at night? Think a bit, would you? Right, that's just like you. As Charlotte snorted and turned away from the prepared food, Ellen stared at her intently. That look, it's like her lips are about to burst out. Well, if you're not going to eat seeing Ellen's gradually protruding lips and gaze, Charlotte tried her best to ignore it and muttered quietly. As if to say, if you don't eat, I won't either. Ellen stared back at Charlotte with her lips pouting, pouting, pouting. She'd be hurt. She'd be really hurt if she didn't eat. It was an almost corset gaze. Fine. I get it. I'll eat, okay? Charlotte seemed genuinely uninterested in eating, but she reluctantly ate because of Ellen. Humph. It's decent enough to eat. The line was so clutch it was appalling, and Harriet blushed, watching Charlotte, wondering if she had been like that. I, I, I'll never, I'll never say that again like humph or humph or right. You're cute enough without resorting to those lines. And since Ellen had become Charlotte's knight, there were times like these. And although Harriet hadn't exactly made PC with her, the four of us gathered in the class dormitory due to Harriet's ambiguous misunderstanding. After eating the meal Ellen had prepared, we had some time for tea. Left to their own devices, Ellen and Charlotte would naturally bicker. Harriet tried her best not to listen, pinching her earlobes when the two began to argue. Of course, that wasn't all they talked about. Did I hear something wrong just now? It's about the increased efficiency of the gate usage. No, I mean if we're within the warp gate sun, we can travel in just one go. I don't know if it's actually possible, but theoretically, it is. I don't know if you'll understand. But I've even created something like a blueprint. That Charlotte asked Harriet if she had found anything useful while looking through research materials at the magic department, and Harriet was merely answering that question. I was also surprised by the conversation. 
improving the warp gate to reach the destination with a single use, rather than consecutive uses. Of course, it wasn't an immediate matter. Charlotte looked at Harriet with a doubtful expression. If what you're saying is true and it really works like that, whoa. I can't even imagine how much things would change. Charlotte seemed to struggle with calculating the frequency that would be brought about by the simplification and optimization of the warp gate. Ellen tilted her head quizzically, and I couldn't help but think that our blockhead was still the best. Come to think of it, Harriet's discovery also had an impact on par with that of power cartridges or moonshine or moon. It was a change beyond my expectations, so I couldn't quite grasp it. Since it was a discovery that would greatly benefit the national interest, it seemed that Charlotte finally began to seriously consider the talent of Harriet de Saint Owen, the greatest genius in magical history, Ellen, Harriet, and Charlotte. The sight of the three of them talking together was unusual, but it didn't look too bad. What's that sister up to these days? As they chatted, with an air of both familiarity and awkwardness, Ellen quietly asked me. Charlotte and Harriet also glanced in my direction, seemingly interested. It wasn't wrong for her to ask me about Olivia's recent activities, but it was somehow intriguing that Ellen was curious about it. Perhaps she had started to feel a sense of kinship, as they were both burdened with the same fate as artifact holders. Olivia hadn't told me anything about what she was going through, as if it were something she'd rather not talk about. In fact, it had been difficult even to run into her, as she was frequently away from the temple. I heard she's working as an inquisitor but I don't know the details. All I knew was that Olivia was searching for clues about the demon god cult. If I were to reveal myself as the demon king, Olivia would stand by my side and keep my secret, however, making that choice would be tantamount to her willingly becoming an enemy of humanity. I'd rather have Olivia not be on anyone's side. No. It would be better if she considered the demon king an enemy, enemy. That way, she wouldn't end up becoming a faceless enemy to countless others. It's better for Olivia to regard the non-existent demon king as an enemy than to make her an enemy of humanity by joining the demon king's side. That's because all I have to do is avoid Olivia. Inquisitor The word itself carried an ominous resonance, so everyone seemed surprised. While the second-year royal class students saw Olivia as a senior with a volatile personality, they weren't unaware that she was known as a saintly figure. That's why they were all taken aback to learn that Olivia was involved in the gruesome work of an inquisitor, capturing and torturing people. Torturing the engagement and the many changes that followed had transformed the political landscape of the continent, as well as our relationships. Among the smallest of changes, we now found ourselves gathered like this in the middle of the night, talking. We hadn't completely fallen apart, but in this strange relationship that felt both awkwardly broken and awkwardly mended, I could feel a precarious, small sense of peace. peace.